Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and if there are people who are trickling in, um, we'll just let them come in as they do. Uh, thank you all for presenting in a post-lunch session, which is always uh, challenging. Uh, but hopefully, you know, the, the papers will be sort of fun enough to keep all of you engaged. And we do have a really interesting set of uh, papers pr presented here um, this afternoon in the panel. Um, they come from sort of all different parts of the world. Uh, and <coughs> break a little bit and will push us a little bit to think beyond the cases that we've been hearing so far uh, this morning and yesterday. So without further ado, um, actually, sorry, maybe I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Neha Sami. I'm one of the faculty here. Uh, and I've met most of you um, over the course of yesterday and today. Uh, but in terms of my work, I do a lot of work around questions of urban governance and politics here at IHS. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand it over to Liza. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us here today. So I'm going to be speaking today about the fiscal city, and I'll explain these terms in a little bit more detail as we go along with the case. Within urban studies, there's a surge of interest in questions of infrastructure. There are, of course, tensions within this work before, between the more technically oriented scholarship, which comes from conventional engineering and planning backgrounds, and those concerned with social and political dimensions of urban infrastructures and systems. However, even within the more social and political leaning groups, there's clear interdisciplinary and ideological divisions. For example, those concerned with splintering urbanism see capitalism and the financialization of land and space as driving spatial enclaves. In contrast, the increasingly large body of work from anthropology and other more relational disciplines use infrastructure to explore the many scales and sites of power and politics which exist in material, regulatory, and even imaginary aspects of infrastructure projects, programs, and systems. Within this burgeoning, if not fully coherent, field of work, the focus within urban studies has typically been on material infrastructures. Gated communities demonstrate the division of power within capital. Water meters help us to understand democracy, poo to understand power, electricity to understand informality. These are incredible contributions to a wider field of study which allows infrastructure not only to provide insights into the infrastructure itself, but instead into wider, more critical, even propositional developments conceptually and theoretically. In addition, it has allowed for new models of studying urban infrastructure which draw from a range of disciplines beyond engineering and planning. It has encouraged and supported the emergence of important terms such as configurations, assemblages, dispositifs, and networks. In my work on urban infrastructure, I take my cue from two important scholars, Susan Starr and Jamie Peck. Starr's seminal work on the ethnographies of infrastructure explores information systems. In the sense, she's not looking at a particular urban infrastructure, not a road, not a water system, but instead the practices of professionals and experts as they interface with computer systems. Peck's work is on land-based financing, in contrast, and explores large-scale infrastructure projects. Here he refers to finance as the infrastructure of infrastructure. Building on these framings, my work explores urban public finance. I explore public finance not as part of infrastructure development, but as an infrastructure itself. Doing so allows me to use tools which are increasingly evolving within the socio-technical and techno-political studies in application to public finance systems. I explore this in the context of Kisumu, a small town in Kenya. Not unlike many African cities, Kisumu town was developed as a colonial outpost, a connection between goods coming from Lake Victoria and the exportation to the coast. During the early days of colonial expansion, Kasumu was a strategic site connecting air, rail, and water. However, within the shifting geopolitical and regional investment frameworks of Kenya, Kasumu's importance faded, leaving the town to, be, to serve the purpose of a regional and ethnic capital. Since independence, Kasumu has been an opposition, a political opposition stronghold, and a site of ongoing political tensions. The infamous 2007 and 2008 election violence in Kenya was sparked first in Kasumu with reverberations around the country. I speak of this violence because it had direct implications for the political settlement which Kenya reached and which was enshrined in their new constitution in 2010. This new constitution was not only a political settlement but also a fiscal settlement. It related to finance and the flows of public money. It had fundamental implications for how the state would then manage public money moving forward. It's within this context 
that I explore the case of public financing Kasumu. It's operations, regulations, discourses, calculations, and practices. It's what I call the fiscal city. In the sense, I use both the small c and the large c to speak of the city as an institutional actor and the city as a material place and the ways in which finance merges and meshes these two experiences. First, I look at the overarching flow of money through the urban state, the big C city. This may sound like a relatively straightforward task, however, it is not. The 2010 constitution dissolved local government in Kenya, replacing it with 47 state governments, endowed, at least legally, with significant amounts of fiscal and political autonomy. The small municipal administrations which ran cities like Kasumu up until that point were usurped into larger county governments, which controlled large urban areas and their surrounding rural and hinterland. As the primary mode of financing is accounting, and the accounting is not a spatial practice. Differentiating between urban and rural income expenditure and assets is not a straightforward task in post-decentralized Kenya. It requires and involves hours of sitting with fiscal administrators compiling from various systems and databases ward and constituency level data, which is neither public, consistently documented, nor easily accessible even to the fiscal administrators, which are meant to make sense of this information. This sort of analysis provides a picture of sorts, even if partial and contingent, and allows us to begin to understand some of the challenges around decentralization in Kenya. In particular, it shows that decentralization is in fact a process of recentralization when we think about this from an urban perspective. To dig deeper into the fiscal development of Kasumu, the pie must, however, be cut in different ways. I explore three fiscal configurations. These configurations help us to understand and make sense of the institutional and, material, institutional and material city and how they relate to one another. In this work, I explore land tax and the way in which officials, through complex and extra-legal practices, force land developers into the tax net. There you can see the valuation role on the far side. I also explore water corporatization and the ways in which state-owned companies, in light of the complete lack of private finance in the sector, work with small-scale enterprises to expand their service. Following this, I explore the tensions of transport grants between national parastatals and local government as they jockey for control over key investments in movement corridors in the city. It's not possible for me to share the plethora of data which emerged from all of these studies, nor would it be useful. Instead, what I would like to do is make the following arguments which emerge from the data and which I hope have implications and usefulness beyond the Kisumu case. First, I would like to say that urban studies must engage more deeply with questions of finance and money. This engagement, however, must go beyond the attention which has been given to what Harvey has referred to as the financialization of everything. Cities like Kisumu are not experiencing this sort of financialization, which their larger counterpart cities like Nairobi and perhaps even Bangalore are experiencing. In fact, their logics of money are fundamentally different, deeply bureaucratic, deeply compliance-based. What this means to be outside of the financialized system must be considered by these smaller African towns and cities. The everyday workings of the fiscal cities, beyond the lens of financialization, draws attention to the practices of fiscal functionaries. Everyday practices around revenue collection, budgeting, uh, asset accounting, and the like. These practices are both manual and deeply political. In some ways, we could use Simone's concept of people as infrastructure to understand the ways in which fiscal functionaries quite literally suture and stitch together the fiscal fabric of the state. Equally, we could see the concept of micropolitics in application not just to the practices of the urban poor, but to those practices of public finance administrators themselves as they work to make sense of how money is in fact flowing through their caskets. This framing of public finance, the centering of fiscal functionaries, the manual nature of this work, the political nature of this work, provides a much richer and more detailed account of the big C than small C city and the fiscal meshes which operate at their interface. But it should not be seen as an anti-technical or technophobic account. It's precisely by providing a critique of the so-called technical, commandeering these tools and discourses, that we are able to create a more creative propositional approach to understanding public finance in smaller towns in Africa. Thank you. Am I on time? You're perfectly on time. Thank you. Um,
so we'll we'll take um, questions at the end, but I just wanted to kind of point out just in the the abstract that you sent in and in, in your conversations, and it's also kind of a personal bias, I guess, in some senses. I'm really, really fascinated to hear more about sort of these tensions that exist between the people who actually who the, the different actors are and the the, the kind of work that they um, that that they do both as part of their sort of public office responsibilities, but also as individuals who are kind of um, because if I think back to say you know similar officials in the Indian context, um, th there is sort of this, this public life that they have in terms of the roles and responsibilities that they execute. But then they also exist as political actors in and of themselves in the machine itself. And, and I'd be really interested in hearing more, uh, especially about this tension between say st state, national, and local level uh, officials at that stage. So um, Amy, would you be willing to go next? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Wyman. I'm a PhD student in the School of Public Health at the University of Cape Town, but also um, working for the African Centre for Cities. And my presentation is going to be a little bit out of the out of the main sort of trajectory that this conference is on. I'm going to be talking about health, um, but mainly to look at why it's important for us to consider health within the urban space, but mainly um, just around the issues of data and the usefulness of just aggregating data down to our, our sub-national levels. So to start the, the presentation of, I thought I'd just frame it, ooh, frame it within the socioeconomic model of health. And um, this is just a model particularly spoken about within the public health field, but it's very relevant to our studies in urban health because it, it speaks about a co complex interaction of underlying factors, um, which we often term as social determinants of health, or it can be other factors within our, our system that can shape and determine health and well-being. And I bring this up because internationally there seems to be a shift away from a focus on what they call a biomedical approach to health, where um, previously it was very much a focus on treatment and primary health care, and now internationally they're starting to acknowledge that these, these underlying um, factors within our living environments that are actually determining our health in the first place, and these are the factors that we need to actually be addressing alongside our primary health care. And cities will provide this important space for us to address these um, factors, not only because these are spaces in which we are living and we have direct exposure to these factors, um, but also that together with our communities and our governments, we're able to shape our environments for good in order to increase our health and well-being. So that's, that's where this, this idea comes from. However, acting on urban um, health inequalities will require the involvement of organized communities and all levels of government. Um, we can't do it individually as, as communities, but we also need to acknowledge that it can't just be the health sector, it has to be all sectors acknowledging their role that they play in shaping our health and well-being. Um, in order to understand, uh, just to include another quote, um, it's also important to realize that the rapid increase of people living in cities will be among the most important global issues of the 21st century, which will affect everyone in this room, which is why I think it's an important conversation to have at this type of conference. In order to understand global country health profiles, we will be needing to have access to good quality data that we can disaggregate in order to understand these contextual factors. And uh, this is why this presentation will be demonstrating an application of how you can combine uh, spatial and epidemiological tools in order to explore health below the national level. So as a case study or example, I'm going to be looking at multimorbidity in South Africa. This is based on research that I did in 2016. Um, to frame this, I'm just going to give some information about South Africa. So it's one of the most urbanized uh, sub-Saharan -Sahar African countries with a high level of socioeconomic inequality. Not only does it have a high level of infectious diseases such as HIV and TB, but now we're seeing a rise in non-communicable diseases, not only amongst the, the wealthy and the affluent, but even amongst the urban poor, such as hypertension, diabetes and cancers. We have increasing antiretroviral use within an already aging population, and this is all leading to a rise in coexisting diseases. And uh, this is what we define as multimorbidity. So multimorbidity will lead to a decline in quality of life for patients, complicate 
complications in treatment plans and increased expenses for medical care, which all has consequences for our health sectors in the urban setting. Within South Africa, at the time of the research that when this was conducted in 2016, multimorbidity was alleged to be present in the population. Um, however, the prevalence and the determinants of multimorbidity were largely under-researched. And multimorbidity was reported to be approximately in 4% of adults, but this value was largely underestimated um, within the, well, people were acknowledging that this was likely to be underestimated. So, our project aimed to fill this gap. We, we realized that multimorbidity needed to be investigated and also exploring the link between um, socioeconomic status and multimorbidity. So the aim of our research was to look at the cross-section and spatial distribution of this multimorbidity using the four uh, key diseases uh, of diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, and HIV, and then the association with socio socioeconomic disadvantage in South Africa. The quantitative data that we had available was this amazing data set called the National Income Dynamics Study, which is a panel study conducted um, with a national re re nationally representative sample of about 28,000 people. It is fantastic because it tracks the same people every two years and it records things ranging from socioeconomic information to uh, health variables to other demographics and income um, variables, so it's a really nice data set. So we were trying to see, can you actually disaggregate this data to find anything useful? Um, <laughs> so we, we did a descriptive analysis of the age-adjusted prevalence of these diseases as well as multimorbidity. We looked at logistic regression, um, we've put up some of the variables, and then also we checked, we looked at uh, the spatial analysis. Um, we used Global Moran's eye statistic and the Get Us All GI Start statistic to look at the hotspots of uh, diseases and how they sh they're occurring over the country. Our study findings um, were quite interesting from uh, hypertension was very much the most prevalent out of any of the diseases. It actually was very similar to what nationally the hypertension rate was. Um, so in 2008, it registered to be 22%, 23%. And in the 2012 sample, it was registering at 32%, um, which we, we were kind of expecting ranges like that. Diabetes, TB, and HIV were severely underreported. And it actually goes back to a lot of uh, this data was self-reported. And this just sort of speaks to some of the limitations around data sets like this. If you have self-reported data, you can get stuck when you disaggregate um, information down to these type of variables, which are stigma related sometimes. Uh, multimorbidity was yet again underestimated at um, around 2.7-2.8%. So we were quite surprised, um, but obviously this is limited to the self-reported nature of the disease data. Um, multimorbidity from the information that we had, um, hypertension was found frequently coexisting with diabetes, which isn't actually a surprising finding. Age is a significant predictor of hypertension as well as multimorbidity. And uh, the odds ratio of multimorbidity was significant and highest for socioeconomically deprived um, people and uh, people living in urban areas as well as obesity. And a lot of these were because of those links with hypertension and those factors. The risk factors of alcohol, exercise and smoking were not found to be statistically uh, significant. So understanding the national um, sort of spatial distribution of multimorbidity, the, this, uh, these figures show the hotspots or what is referred to as a clustering of multimorbidity prevalence where districts with a higher than average um, prevalence of multimorbidity would be clustered together and is shown in red. The blue shows below average clustering um, or prevalence of multimorbidity clustered together. And uh, as you can see on the map, um, South Africa, uh, the, I'm just showing on the left here, the hotspots are more on the southeastern coast of South Africa. And this relates to a socioeconomic distribution map where we are looking at 
um, the prevalence of socioeconomic dis disadvantage. We calculated this using multi a multi-dimensional poverty index and um, the percentage of people within each district that were considered to be socioeconomically disadvantaged. And the darker boundaries showed um, the, the, the density of, of it. And this correlated with the layout of the, of the multi-mobility distribution. So in conclusion, this type of example just shows the use of combination of techniques in order to understand health profiles at sub-national levels. And the disaggregation of data is also able to highlight variations across geographies. And it just kind of gets us thinking, um, if we had to keep doing this for our cities, perhaps we are able to find really important um, health uh, patterns across our cities, which are very important for our, our policy makers. And um, nevertheless, the study draws attention to the limitations around disaggregation of data. How many of our countries actually have good quality data that we can understand these local level patterns? Um, so our future work will be looking at uh, trying to mine a little bit more of this data. We're going to be looking at non-health and health sectors in the Western Cape, which is the province that Cape Town is located in. And uh, we'll be hope hopefully developing an integrated data platform. We'll be developing an urban health monitoring tool in order to measure health inequalities across the city and then um, provide this to policymakers so that they can do targeted approaches, particularly looking at informal settlements and um, measuring how when they upgrade informal settlements, how will the health patterns change across the city. So just to get you thinking about health within the urban space and how they really are um, important sort of patterns to think about. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's actually really nice to um, kind of hear a paper that focuses a little bit more on methods. As you know, we've been talking, um, we don't often see a lot of that. In, in research conferences, it's nice to see that. Um, I'd also be interested in, in, in hearing a little bit more about how perhaps you would take this out to practitioners and policy makers, because it really does have a very strong uh, sort of policy angle to it. And I can imagine a lot of uh, you know, policy makers and practitioners who work in both planning as well as public health actually being really interested in seeing some of the findings that your research is coming up with. Great, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Cairns. I'm based in the Future Cities Laboratory, which is in Singapore. Uh, this background's important uh, for two reasons. <laughs> um, I'm also, um, our unit is, is run by um, the Swiss University ETH Zurich. And this is a technical university. And of course, you know, uh, probably Singapore's view, vision on urbanity and urban development also is also technically motivated. So my contribution, in a way, is to, a little bit, is to bring some of this kind of technical background into this kind of discussion, I hope in a complementary way. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, I'm, I'm going macro. So again, this is a kind of health warning. Um, excuse the pun. But the, we're, we're thinking about much larger sort of uh, issues. But I do so in a way that I hope directly interacts with many of the papers that I've heard. Um, and in particular, because I'm interested in the question of food, uh, the panel uh, this morning and the one that followed it, so if you were at those ones, you, you may recall this kind of very detailed ethnographic sort of work. Uh, it may not look like it, but I, that's why I hope to be able to close the loop um, in this work. And then finally, um, it's, it's very methodological in focus. So it's almost content free, but I really want to demonstrate a certain kind of methodological experiment that comes a, ba a little bit back to our sort of technical background, our DNA um, of, our, of our institutional focus. Um, um, if you would like uh, to read a bit more on this, the argument builds on um, a paper uh, that was published just last year. Um, it's called Debilitating City Centricity, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that as a way of introduction. Um, it's in the Routledge Urbanization Handbook. If you, if you Google that title, and uh, there's a PDF version currently available. Routledge has made it available for free for now. So if you want to read that. The second part um, is, this is more methodological. I'm going to introduce a software called Earthscape. Um, Earthscape uh, is designed as an open source software and it's downloadable uh, at this website, which I'll come back to again at the end. And we would very much like you to be interacting with the software. This is beta level, so it's still quite rough. But if you're interested in Brave, uh, 
uh, please do uh, interact with it. And I'll tell you why I hope that's relevant um, as we go along. So let me back up a little bit and start with this term, debilitating city, city centricity. Um, I think we've all seen this drawing, or if you haven't seen this particular drawing, you've seen some version of it. Um, it's a very powerful format, but it's flawed, of course, in many ways. The version that you may have seen, this comes out every two years underneath the UN's Urbanization Prospects uh, uh, data collection, uh, and it's problematic for many reasons. The one that you may have seen aggregates the whole world into urban and rural, splits it very cleanly, and then plots that over time. What this does, it splits basically the global north and the global south. So what you see in red and green is basically green is the rural population, urban is the red, um, and this is only applying to Africa and Asia in particular. And you can see that they meet this kind of tipping point predicted for 2020. Uh, the one for the two lower lines, which of course is Europe and, and North America, those two lines intersected somewhere in the 1950s. But if you agglomerate all those together, you know probably that in, uh, this, this key date in 2007 and this is the global tipping point for these two lines, and that was a huge media event, and arguably the reason we're meeting here today. In other words, I think that diagram triggered a huge excitement and interest in urban studies beyond the much more academic work that was already going on. So this is a flawed drawing, but it's a very significant one, which is uh, why I come to it. And it's flawed for two, two reasons. There are many other reasons, but there are two that interest me. Um, first of all, of course, it's the ontological question, what's the city and what's the rural? And we've had many, many examples of that kind of discussion today. So that's almost impossible to determine. More and more so, I would argue, as we go along. And it's secondly uh, problematic if you take the perspective of the planetary urbanization argument. So if you, if you look at Neil Brenner's work and Christian Schmidt's work, you say, well, actually, it's almost kind of ridiculous to suggest that there is any differentiation. The whole thing is inside something called urbanization. So whichever position you take, and both are kind of defensible in different ways, uh, this is a problematic drawing because it doesn't help us. Statistically, um, there are people, of course, in the UN who insist on tr still trying to understand what is the limit of the city and wh where does the rural begin. So that's still a live statistical project. And I happen to believe that still, there's still reasons why we should pursue that project. But if we do so to the ignorance and disinterest of the planetary urbanization story, then of course we're it's very naive and problematic. So I have this kind of intermediate position, and that intermediate position is what we call urban rural systems. It tries to have uh, a, a kind of foot in both camps, if you like. So the most obvious way is to think about the kind of problematic nature of these, of course, so that those lines, that distinction between the city and the, and the countryside is already unraveling. And there are lots of examples presented in this paper, but if we plot something called peri-urbanism, uh, ex-urbanism along that rural line, and if we, cr this is, there's no data behind this by the way, this is just speculative, and let's say we put Desakota, um, I can't quite read what these other ones are, suburb and favela, and let's take that 2020 split, it's no longer a tipping point, it's a very, very messy situation in which peri-urban and Desakota and urban-rural conditions all kind of mix together, and of course there are plenty who argue that there, is, there are rural conditions right embedded inside the biggest of the world's megacities. So this is already de um, uh, empirically, uh, demonstrably unravelling. Um, so our approach to this is to say, well on the other hand, we don't quite believe that the whole of the world is wrapped up in something called urbanization. So we're skeptical of that, although we admit it's a very significant position inside this story. Um, so where, where we began then was to say, well, what is, as, as urbanists, what if we started to take the other condition in the binary seriously? What if we were to look at the rural and try and understand that from the perspective and the approaches are of, an, of an urbanist? So in a way, this is charting a little bit of our kind of uh, uh, amateurish attempts to think, start to think about uh, the countryside. And we did that by starting with the FAO, where else would you begin? Um, and this is amazing fact uh, appears uh, re relatively quickly and is repeated again and again and again. Now those of you who are aficionados of millet, for example, or sugarcane and so on, um, those figures apparently appear just below this. But these are the dominant crops of the world and remain so according to FAO uh, census data. So 60% of the world's food and energy intake hinges on these three plants, even if we have 50,000 to, to choose from. So this is a very important opening kind of fact for us. Um, and I'm going to be very quick with this. We then spatialize that data, um, which maybe, I don't know if you can see. Yes, you can. Uh, let me just go this through this. So we took the three, uh, the three crops, 
and we spatialize them. Um, so I'm going to just skip through this. So you see, you'll see rice. When it's red, we combine that with population density. And this, I'll, I'll demonstrate why that's important in a, uh, in a moment. So we go to the United States, and again, we'll see the three crops, so maize, uh, wheat, and some rice. But you notice the red, the population density centers em emerge as gaps within those hinterlands. That's a fairly obvious point. I'm going to skip again. When you get to Europe, it's roughly the same story. In this wheat footprint, you can already see the whole of where London is. You can already see the whole where Paris is, for example. So the urban and rural are crisply defined, and the data demonstrates that for us. I think you know where I'm going to go with this. <laughs> um, these are quite large combinations, but of course the story gets really interesting when we, when we move to monsoon Asia. So here the three crops are, present, are present in very powerful ways. So wheat, maize, and most significantly, of course, uh, of course is, is rice. But what gets really interesting is where we put the population here. There, are, th there is no hole here for Dhaka or Calcutta. So at this level of aggregation, there is no distinction between rural areas and urban areas. Now, of course, this is a matter of scale. But look, if you look at the whole of that sort of Ganges watershed, for example, it's urban and rural at the same time or at least population densities which are urban-like in quality. So we took that observation a bit further, and I think you probably know uh, there is a very significant reasons for that. That's to do with mechanization, uh, the incredible drop in population densities related to the quick mechanization of wheat and maize. Um, and you can do a very simple popular culture scan, and you will never find large numbers of people harvesting wheat in, in, uh, in, in popular circulation except for occasional films like this. But even here, this is about machinery. These are kind of uh, machine, uh, machinic sort of uh, interactions. Rice, of course, is completely different to that. Uh, rice grows potentially three seasons a year on much, much smaller plots, typically worldwide under one hectare, as opposed to about 80 or 90 hectare for wheat as a worldwide average. And again, if you play the same, the same kind of game, you can see it always involves manual labor, and it always involves large numbers of people. And most um, uh, significantly to this story, um, they're typically uh, uh, women is, are, are overrepresented in this kind of labor. And then when we look, um, the, uh, rice agriculture is also massively resistant to, to, uh, to mechanization, um, even if there are kind of some very good developments more recently. So this is also very significant in retaining this relationship between high productivity of the main grains and high population density at the same time. So um, monsoon Asia then became a very significant uh, uh, topic or mythological site, site for us in a way to start to think about because it's the, it's the relationship between those crops, the intensity of those crops, um, the, man, the manual labor that is involved in harvesting those crops and the relationship to the ecosystem of monsoon Asia. So I'm going um, to speed up through this. So this is the, um, the tool, the methodological tool that I, w I wanted to basically show to you. I, won't, I have a demonstration, a live demonstration that maybe I can, I can borrow a minute to show you. But what this, this is the interface. Um, it's open source and downloadable. Um, what it has is a range of data sets on the left hand side, a map in the middle, and then a number of different tools that you can interact with that data. Most of that data on the left hand side is publicly available existing data. So it's the same data that we had from the FAO and the UN Urbanization Prospects and so on. However, this allows you to interact with that data in a much more sort of intuitive way and un to understand that, or at least study that data. So I'm going to do the same exercise. Um, the, the red lines that you see here is the outline of regions that have two main parameters. I've taken a 500 people per square kilometer as the, as the demographic threshold. I'm afraid you're going to have to look at this one. So this, the, the tool allows you to combine different data sets. So this is combining two data sets. It's looking at the, the different uh, agricultural yields that I talked about earlier, and it's looking at demographic data. So the area that you see in red here is uh, 500 people per square kilometer and 500 tons a year in 2000. This is that, that's what that data set is of, of wheat. Uh, this is the same uh, two data sets except showing maize. Uh, 
and this is rice. So let's repeat uh, the story that we've just seen. This is all of them combined together. So remember, this is not just yield, this is not just agricultural territory, but there's very interesting overlap between relatively high population densities and relatively high yields. For those of you who are non-urbanists, 500 people per square kilometre is about an American suburban town. So this is already city-like as a kind of density. Um, you can probably, again, imagine where I'm going to go with this. So this is Europe, the same, uh, the same parameters applied for wheat. So much smaller footprints and much more fragmented. Um, this is maize and there's almost no rice except for that sort of Veneto area in northern, northern Italy. And this is them all combined. And again, if we go to the States, it's even more startling how the relationship between high yield and high demographics uh, are almost not present. So it comes back to our first hypothetical uh, uh, figure. And in a way, this is the conclusion of the paper, is to simply to say there's something fundamentally different about the relationship between population densities and agricultural productivity. Remember, bearing in mind, I've got this very strict set of... Cri I'm only talking about the three crops. I'm only talking about the data that's available, uh, and so on and so on. So there are many, many caveats around this. Our argument, of course, is that if you use this tool, we can, we can inspect the currently available data that's already being used to make, uh, by the Asian Development Bank, by the World Bank, to make large investment decisions. So this is a more intensive way of trying to use the existing data. What I can't show you, given the time, is that we can zoom in and we can start to interact with crowdsource data. So that finally allows us to interact with highly localized data and these kind of global data sets. And that, well, that's when it gets especially interesting. Um, two last slides. This is just to remind myself and to everybody else that this also involves a dialogue with ethnography. So our ethnographic work is in dialogue with the satellite data. So we th see this as a very significant uh, development. So I work with a couple of colleagues who are doing ethnography, which is guided, if you like, by those, those satellite images. Um, and then finally, we're interested in dialogues. This is the, the, new, uh, West, uh, the new governor of West Java, and he's interested in this kind of urban-rural connection, and he's started to think about using the tool. Um, and my final point is to say this is no small issue. We know, again, this kind of data, but this is over half of the world's population, and it's massively under-theorized for reasons, I think, that we, all, that we all know. So we have to start to build on the legacy of North American and European urban theory, but it, for me, it involves a new relationship between urban theory and agricultural science, and I think there's lots of examples of that here. Um, again, that's the website. Uh, we'd love you to download it. It is quite accessible. It's quite usable. Um, it'll be updated in the, in the coming months, and you'll be able to upload your own data to this uh, within the next two or three months. So I'd be happy to have questions and discussions perhaps after the session. Thank you very much. Um, that was actually really, really interesting and, and it resonates a lot with some of the work that we've been doing here at IHS on, on actually thinking about what the urban really is. Um, and and it, it, I think, resonates quite nicely also with, with a couple of the points that the earlier two papers made um, around sort of the importance of the urban, especially when it comes down to administrative and sort of public jurisdictions. Uh, but then when we actually see it manifested on the ground, it ends up looking very different. And so it, it also comes back in some ways to the question of how do we design uh, administrative and governing systems for these kinds of, of, of settlements that you know, start to push the boundaries of, of what is urban, what is rural, but are, are urban-like in terms of their density, but are perhaps not quite urban-like in terms of the sort of services and needs that the, the local populations have. Um, so over to our final presentation for this afternoon. Uh, Chetan? Yeah, no, um, stretch to the extents, but that's fine. I can begin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Chetan Kolkarni. I'm a student of urban design at University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I'm showing some of the work uh, that I'm doing on the Pearl River Delta region in south of China. So, um, yeah. This is a image of land cover of the Delta region uh, with the Pearl River in 1978. Uh, fast forward 30 years, this is the amount of urbanization it has undergone. 
um, and we'll get to the reasons why it is. But currently, um, this is the transformation at a level for the fishing community. Same occupation, but the context in which they're fishing has changed dramatically. Um, presently, the region is um, an agglomeration of 11 cities, uh, including Hong Kong and Macau, uh, the special administrative regions. It's an agglomeration of 120 million people um, in these cities. Uh, the context in which Pearl River Delta is important is that China's focus on national system of agglomerations uh, is important, and the way it's divided is in three degrees. Uh, primary, which is um, Beijing, Tianjin, and Yangtze, and then Pearl River Delta on the south, and then smaller regional clusters um, to um, its east and west. Uh, similarly, the corridor development between core cities is developed in to connect these regional clusters to facilitate economic growth. Uh, when you straighten out this network, uh, that's what it is. Uh, Pearl River Delta to the south, Yangtze in the middle, and Beijing Tianjin on the north. Um, the reason why this urbanized delta is unique and important is because um, it has evolved as a delta in a very different um, situations. Uh, in the Chinese environmental history, um, deltas are typically formed by sedimentary depositions of rivers in the lower reaches and land starts getting formed by silting. Uh, the process in this case was fast forwarded by one millennium and this has been studied uh, because it was a result of human activities. Um, in the 20th century, uh, it underwent radical transformation due to political reforms and it resulted in different forms of urban development in the region. Uh, but the pace of it um, has caused friction between the deltaic environmental processes and the resultant urban form. Uh, this is making of the delta as coined by Robert Marx in his book, Documenting the Environmental History. Quick uh, story of the delta. The early settlers settled in northern part of the province. Uh, they cleared land to start farming um, for rice. Uh, because of this deforestation, the silt flowed down, started forming land in the delta. Uh, the Mongols invaded in, and these settlers fleed south and settled and started farming in the south. Uh, because of this, um, there was the process of silting was fast forwarded so much that uh, the delta was formed a thousand years faster. Um, they employed significant uh, amount of water works to control irrigation activities and um, the primary form of administrating uh, farming as and also all activities was the canal system. So this is a map of the levees that were developed in order to channelize water, to contain water and uh, develop a way of flow of um, goods across the region. Uh, the three kinds of water infrastructure um, that you could see is the trade port on the dock, a, a network of canals that would transport the goods from the dock to inland areas, and a system of uh, farming uh, which had fish ponds and mulberry embankments, um, where the, where, which would be in the inland areas. This um, system was developed as a result of the need for silk and sugar in European markets, so rice fields were converted into fish ponds with mulberry embankments in order to cultivate, um, do fish farming. Uh, and I have severely documented this area in um, seven of the 11 cities, and this is a video which shows some of that context. It's a vast expanse, and if you see actually far in, in the backdrop is the actual village settlements. Um, to realize why this is uh, why this area transformed, um, there were significant political reforms. Um, uh, one during the Cultural Revolution, the state adopted a totalitarian approach. Um, everyone grew poor together, or everyone grew prosperous together. Uh, when the economy opened up in 1978, um, with Deng Xiaoping um, doing um, welcoming industrial activity, uh, this area got urbanized. Uh, just 
Um, so the methodology for doing this research was a series of field visits, um, tremendous amount of literature review of plan-led development in the region um, through different periods of time in the 20th century. And I also want to share some early studies to document this overlay between um, urban development and the ecological understanding of the data. Uh, this was corroborated with a lot of meetings with researchers in this region uh, with the aim of adding to the discourse on urbanism in the region. For another plans that I want to show, uh, which was which acknowledge sustainable development and and the need for coordinated planning, was the Pearl River Delta Urban System Plan in 1995. Um, this was a result because of fragmented development of uh, township and village enterprises in um, rural areas uh, after the reforms, and because they were so fragmented, the transit infrastructure was almost kind of resulted in a makeshift manner. So they developed four land uses to coordinate this development. What that resulted in was three core cities and the small and mid-sized cities between them being merely on the route between the core cities. Um, the resultant urban form because of the pace of development is observed in urban villages um, such as these um, and you can see they're fairly self-organized but they have some form of interventions uh, because now they're developed as tourist areas and so on. Um, but amongst the region, you will see regional corridors having a mix of sporadic developments between industrial areas and agrarian areas. Um, so to, in order to synthesize this entire development, uh, I adopted a mode of scenario planning. How do you kind of envision the development of new urban forms in this area? One was to outline all the drivers of change um, and outline the critical relationships that are important. Um, and determining. So this process looked at a uh, series of factors and drivers of development at the level of city and region and identified critical relationships in order to assess different scenarios that would result in that case. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them but I will point out the, the ideal scenario which is resiliency planning in relation to the adverse effects of climate change and coordinated regional development and social cohesion, and the worst one being fragmented, uh, continuous fragment development, unsustainable, and delta subsidence, and uh, that posing more risk. Um, so to identify what is critical uh, in the development of Pearl River Delta is an overlay of two factors, a deep understanding of ecology of the delta in relation to the drivers of coordinated development. What is the context in which we're debating this? Uh, the peripheral cities of this delta are being planned to merge within the delta extents of the current region uh, to boost industrial and manufacturing activity, but also boost innovation and service-oriented um, economic growth. The other is development of large-scale infrastructure and facilitate connectivity. This is the Hong Kong, Zhuhai, Macau bridge. You could remain an hour and a half on this bridge driving. And what I feel is most important is to avoid um, limited and contained development by looking at intercity projects. So the Greater Bay Area is facilitated to, through tr tremendous amount of bridge infrastructure, but also forming of zones. Um, and they were formed earlier with a very different intent um, to boost economic activity. Now they're formed with the intent of integrating with its uh, current urban form. And innovation corridors, and what that means for urban designers and so on is um, a whole lot of corridor development for tech companies and um, startups. But why, why that is important to look at, at these intercity projects, is in three verticals at the level of city and the region. Ecological evolution of the delta, people-oriented planning, and res response to new economic drivers. Uh, but how do you get really specific to address concerns of this delta? Because urban design can be quite universal, and we all believe in good agendas. Uh, but Kenneth Burke's framework outlined identifying critical factors in response to each design act. Uh, who does it? How do they do it? Uh, what is the purpose and the message they're trying to get across? And what is the background and setting in which they're doing this? So my paper actually addresses each kind of urban design and planning idea in response to which stakeholder and which actor in this region would be able to do it. Um, but the Delta concerns. Um, in future evolution of the delta, and this is in a much larger expanse of time, is seawater intrusion, 
um, sea level rise, flooding, and water contamination. So I, I decided to model this out. Uh, the sedimentary environment of the delta is divided in four parts, mouth of the river, and as you go further inland, different areas. So uh, this digital elevation model basically is a simulation of that environment and the city locations in that topography. Uh, this is a modulation of the sea level rise as projected by 1.4 meters uh, by the end of the century. And what that, able to, what that makes you able to do is um, outline all the elevation points and zoom in and see which areas would be the most vulnerable uh, to delta concerns. Uh, and the landform sections, this is through the Wutongshan uh, mountain in Shenzhen area, uh, to look at intercity projects, but at a much more urban scale, and look at that overlay more critically. So the concerns regarding uh, evolution of the delta, sea level rise, salinity intrusion, uh, subsidence of the delta, and the mixing of fresh water from upstream uh, areas of the river with seawater. Uh, and this whole network of uh, river systems, um, it's more important to, for urban designers to kind of zoom in at almost a site-specific scale to address these concerns. Yeah, just wrapping up. Um, so this is converted into a model that would be much more easier to handle and um, envision future urban development. Uh, and so this is the kind of topography um, and divided by latitude and longitude, you can zoom in on a lot more detailed urban scale. And so this is what it looks like, where you can overlay all the networks and structures of transportation, land use, and um, ecological concerns. So basically what I'm trying to do with these studies is simulate different urban design visions in response to the indigenous and traditional wisdom of their practices in the Delta but also look at that overlay of current urbanization and the path of progress ahead. Um, that's all for now. And maybe it would help for the discussion, but I just want to show a video. I'm not sure if it will play. But so I just want to show, this is the actual trade zone that were marked in the 80s. Uh, this is the kind of waterfront office and you know development along transit corridors. And all of this is kind of self-organized clusters, historic clusters contained by new development, rapid, residential development in the middle of it, um, some form of redevelopment in these historic clusters, and incubator campuses, and so on. And that's the kind of fabric we're dealing with. But yeah, that's all. Thank you. So thank you very much to all four. Also, especially for keeping very closely to time, uh, which means we've got a lot of time left open for, for Q&A. Um, before we open it up to the, to the audience, um, I just wanted to say what struck me really uh, was when I first read the papers, it was, it was difficult to see kind of the, the, the thread through all of them uh, in, in the beginning, but as I read them more and as I listened to the presentations, it almost seems to me that they're uh, a nested set of papers in some senses, where, uh, you know, Stephen's and, and uh, Chetan's papers seem to be looking much more at macro level questions uh, that are then kind of in some ways challenged and, and sort of pushed back on by the, the two papers by sort of Liza and Amy, which are talking much more about sort of the lived realities of the experiences of um, cities that are rapidly growing, developing and changing on the ground and how they in some way deal with these kinds of sort of macro level visions and perspectives of transformation uh, and then how one actually deals with them uh, and you know, so, th so that tension between what's going on on the ground in some senses and how one deals with challenges of design or uh, challenges of how one thinks through you know what really constitutes the urban uh, and in some ways you know thinking of the ways in which the, the rhythms of, of government and public finance or even questions of, you know, uh, looking at sort of the spatiality that, that you laid out, Amy, in your, in your paper on health and how that, that kind of pulls and pushes um, and, and challenges some of these conceptions and how we can sort of in some ways reframe and engage with sort of more on the ground um, ethnographic work or detailed sort of case study work to actually bring back um, some of these questions that we're, that we're seeing in sort of urban evolution uh, and bring them to sort of deal with existing urban form that we have uh, in, in um, our cities today. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to the floor for questions. Did... Oh, 
Hi, uh, my question is to uh, Lisa. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I was just, uh, you know, uh, it's really interesting, and I was wondering if you could uh, uh, speak more about like how uh, the fiscal arrangement, the fiscal micropolitics of Kisumu, uh, articulate with the homogenizing, uh, articulate with the demands of international capital coming in, and the homogenizing sort of. Uh, you know, auditing practices or financial practices, because uh, some of the anthropological work on, uh, you know, for example, the one that looks at World Bank as a anthropological site has looked at how you know uh, international capital is not, uh, you know, uh, is not a driver of homogenization, but often enough adjusts to the micropolitics already in place. Uh, in um, you know pushing forward its agendas, so it would be really interesting. Anyways, it was really good. Hi, uh, thank you. Those were like really fascinating set of papers. My question is for Mr. Stephen, and this is like uh, about your data and the platform you have provided, and how does that speak to the smart cities when the entire uh, literature and the ideas of smart cities is about more about getting better data, more data, and, and again, the aspects of sustainability. How does your paper, or the platform you have created, speak to the ideas of smart cities? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, my first question is uh, with respect to the physical city. Uh, I wanted to ask if the physical city is some kind of a response to uh, the, I mean, I'm adding to the same question, is, is some kind of a response to the global circuits of capital flow? Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm asking, uh, my question is with, res with respect to the physical city. Uh, if, we, if we try to understand this physical city from a genealogical perspective, is it some kind of existence of certain uh, mercantile or agrarian capitalism uh, in, in such places that we see uh, th this particular physical city in the contemporary form as a response to that particular genealogical existence? Uh, of certain production uh, systems in, 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 in while you study this, uh, th those particular cities. Uh, my second question is uh, with respect to, uh, 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 to Chris uh, about uh, when you talk about defining urban, uh, isn't that when you talk about uh, the production means as, as one way of defining urban is on ontologically very similar to Lefebvrean uh, response of that urban is more to be defined with something respect to the production means. So because uh, it's it's a it's a it's a it, uh, because the agriculture, you know, the productivity of agriculture is more to do with what kind of investments in infrastructure has happened, and it is something to do with how the you know the state sees those uh, means of production. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So my question is for Amy, and uh, I think it was wonderful to see that the conceptualization moved from a biomedicalized conception of health to social determinants of health, and then, then you just gave how I think the different health conditions are correlated with uh, uh, socioeconomic indicators, yeah? And uh, I think once we move from biomedical to social, and I think social becomes so complex, uh, so in the sense that how do you further uh, go down to that? So, so you have a socioecological model. Uh, so would uh, there be two uh, sub model or two different complementary model uh, regarding uh, communicable disease uh, uh, and the non-communicable, uh, infectious disease model and the non-communicable disease? For instance, in, in terms of you said that uh, uh, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, and diabetes are underreported because there's, there's a certain level of stigma, uh, stigma attached to that. And I, I, I understand that HIV, maybe there's a, there's a particular kind of sexual morality, which I think the stigma is it's correlated with kind of sexual morality, which is, I was just also curious in the sense that how, why is, but why is diabetes stigmatized? And the reporting of diabetes stigmatized? I think the broader question then it becomes, then when we, when we move from the conception of biomedical pathology to social determinant, and the social itself becomes so complex, so is it about f further uh, narrowing down the resolutions 
to particular conditions within the social, or are we just happy at that one aggregated multi-morbidity so social model? Thanks, these are really great questions. I'm gonna start with a question in the back about why I use the concept of the fiscal city. So for me, the fiscal city is a lens. So you could look at you could look at the city through a whole range of different tools and instruments, and by looking at the fiscal city, you open up a particular set of processes that you're tracking. Why I then use the big C city and the small C city, or the sort of the city concept, is because I think there's been insufficient amount of work which really looks at the way in which public finance mediates the relationship between the institutional city and the institutional city being the various actors which govern uh, public actors factors which govern the urban area and the urban area itself and its changing spatial dynamics. So it's, it's actually a tool uh, more, than it, more, more than it is a, a sort of a critique of, of a concept. It's a sort of methodological move. Um, in terms of the way in which uh, global financial practices land, it's a fascinating question. And one thing that became very, very clear in my study was that despite nearly 30 years of calls for decentralization among leading developmental voices like the World Bank, they are still primarily lending to national governments with regional investment paradigms. So what you see in the case, uh, the case study I look at around road grants and, and road investments more generally is that these, there's still a, a sort of nationalized understanding and a regionalized understanding of what these big GDP oriented investments are going to look like and then they land on the urban fabric in very aggressive ways. Quite interestingly the 2007-2008 election violence took place in the city center of Kisumu and the 2017 violence which was the, when I was there took place at the World Bank interchange right outside the city where they had built a bypass where the Chinese had built a bypass road funded by the World Bank um, and in fact where the, they were supposed to divert around the city, in fact, become the new central hub of the city. And this is where they were burning tires and burning down buildings. So there is a very clear articulation with the material city, less of an articulation with the institutional city as the county governments become completely sidestepped because they can't print their own currencies and therefore are not really very interesting to these global lenders, despite discourses around decentralization and good governance. Just the very last one I'd like to respond to is your personal political question. Um, and my favorite story is one that's actually from work I did in Nairobi, not in Kisumu. And uh, I remember before we went, people saying to us, uh, no, officials are not going to understand land-based financing instruments. They're going to be too complicated for them. We arrive and we start talking to officials who have bought all of the land surrounding the Tika Highway investment, fully aware that that land is going to gain value and that they themselves are going to benefit from that. Um, there was, this is not illegal. They have every right to buy land in the city. They are landowners in the city, these officials who are you know, accountants and engineers and whatnot. Just a sense that people very much understand these instruments and in fact are leveraging them for personal gain um, and, uh, and play both a personal and, and, and a professional role in the city. So that's a sort of micro story in response to that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I actually think they're linked in a kind of weird way, the two questions. So. Um, Let's set aside the smart city debate, right? So we know that smart city is a kind of a marketing phrase. And although it's taken very seriously now, um, it really began as a kind of uh, a tech company sort of catchphrase. Uh, there's obviously a, a, a quite a serious reality behind it, however, because it's, it's hinging on a certain kind of technological development, which for me involves uh, two main things. One, one is, is the cheapening and the uh, miniaturization of sensing technology. And this is everything from a lens, a gyroscope, everything you can find in your mobile phone, increasing Linau body wearables and so on, um, all the way up to satellites, which are circulating the Earth, which is why I think the two questions are linked. So um, the relative ubiquity um, of those sorts of technologies, whatever you call it, it's smart city, somebody would have called it something. In our lab, we call it the responsive city because we think that gets better at the possibilities of this ubiquitization uh, of, of this kind of technology. So the first thing is the technology is real, um, it's getting more ubiquitous, it's getting cheap, um, and we are swimming, it, we're drowning in data. So it, it, every single one of us is a data point in this room, of course, and we're giving off thousands of data points every single moment of the day. So um, the sheer ubiquity of output of that demands, I think, a, 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 kind of, a kind of response. So I think the smart city, um, although crude, in fact, is quite, is, is quite a, 
an intelligent way of somehow packaging that. It just happens to do it in a kind of very kind of narrow way. So our work tries to um, engage with the same phenomenon. So we're interested, I mean, I showed you on the left-hand side of the platform uh, were about seven or eight set of data sets, most of which uh, came from satellites. So most of that's free. Um, however, if you have more money, you can buy a high resolution kind of data and so on and so on. Um, what I couldn't show you um, is, that, is that when we zoom in, we can then attach data sets from uh, mobile phone data, telco data, for example. Uh, we could do, we could track wearables if everybody in this room, uh, a local neighborhood organization could uh, count the number of, um, uh, number of children who are, who are, who are going to school. Uh, we, could, we could track anything. Anything becomes a kind of data point. So our approach is to say it ha it's better if it's open source. Um, it's better if the technology uh, tries to break with what I call the GIS paradigm, which is a very crude and very unsatisfying way of thinking about spatial data. So we've tried to make it much more intuitive, much more engaging, and we've also tried to make it free. Uh, but I, I just happen to believe that it's impossible not to engage with data, and the smart city is, a, is, is one way of doing it, but it, it's, it's flawed in a number of ways. So this is an attempt to broaden that. Um, but we're engaging roughly the same sort of technologies. Um, the satellite, I suppose, is the one that, that you saw most. Uh, that's very significant, and, but we pair it. And I, I come back to this point that you made. Um, from what you saw, of course, it's impossible. It, it looks like we're pushing back, or at least the ethnographers are pushing back to us. I just refuse that. I refuse that argument because we are all inside the data as a kind of medium. Rely, you know, if you're in the field doing ethnography, you're in the eye of the satellite. So it's up to us to try and think about the relationship between the two. So I don't think one's about remote, one's local. So we try and talk about remote sensing, intimate sensing, and ethnog ethnographic sensing, which is interacting with the satellite, for example. Um, this is also an old play of the, of the old global local kind of argument, but of course it's far more productive if you're thinking about this as a kind of interrelationship. And for me, that, that links back to the, the other question, which I, um, we, we simply try to take an agnostic view of what is the rural and what is the urban, uh, because this is one of the oldest binaries that we have been bequeathed, right? And most of that binary, that, that, that relationship was established in the West, I think it's European urban experience that delivered the urban and the rural, and I tried to show that uh, demographically. If you go far back enough, you could probably find arguments about the, the herbs and the rural, uh, the rurs in, in, in kind of classical literature, for example. Um, so what we try to do is an experiment, which is to say, let's just imagine that the urban and the rural don't exist as categories. Let's say they don't exist as jurisdictions, of which, of course, they do. Um, and let's just try and look at the symptoms so what's a symptom of a city? As you say, there are many more. They're, they're not just demographic concentration. Uh, it's the amount of asphalt, it's the number of jobs, the mix of jobs, uh, where there is a certain governance system, a particular kind of agglomeration economy, and so on. The rural tends to be spaces of production, social conservatism, uh, monofunctional uh, uh, landscapes. So I, I, I get that. But let, I think now is the time to try and let, rethink that because the symptoms don't support that old binary any longer. The rural is not just a side of social conservatism. The economy is mixing and diversifying. And if you take the argument about decentralizing technologies, decentralizing governance, as we heard yesterday from the example of Kerala, for example, um, this, is not, this binary is starting to kind of shake. And, and my argument is that it's the responsibility of researchers in this part of the world to take leadership on that, because European and Americans won't because the countryside is basically mechanized. I'm being crude here, but generally speaking, it's, sort of, it's a mechanized, roboticized countryside. So in a way, the old urban-rural condition does play and does make sense there, but I don't think it does here. So that, that was a kind of experiment. And people like Lefebvre, I think, are part of that legacy of supporting the old binary uh, of the urban and the rural. Excuse the, uh, the rant. Thank you so much for your question regarding uh, the infectious diseases and NCDs and possibly separating them out. Um, the, your question around um, whether it'd be useful to have like sort of separate social ecological models for infectious diseases and NCDs, it's an interesting question because I think traditionally people used to look at these quite separate, separately, mainly because infectious diseases did carry their own stigma, like you mentioned, particularly with HIV and TB. 
But NCDs, non-communicable diseases, also carry an, a different type of stigma because they've been termed unfairly as in, uh, diseases of lifestyle. And I think there is a temptation to look at them separately, but through this research and this emerging amount of research around multimorbidity, particularly in developing countries, we're seeing an increase in prevalence of both infectious diseases and NCDs within one individual. And uh, in addition to this, like infectious diseases are offer, often being aggravated by factors that would normally aggravate NCDs. For example, um, people who have infectious diseases, if they're living, if they aren't exercising, if they're exposed to high levels of stress, unhealthy diets, which typically would aggravate like hypertension or diabetes, this is also putting pressure on your immune system and then infectious diseases could be getting worse. So I think it's very much you've got to take a step back and look at these diseases as a whole and understand, like almost apply a systems approach to understanding diseases within the urban space um, and looking at factors all together because if you try to separate it out you could lose uh, important connections. Um, regarding our finding with diabetes being underreported, we thought at first it might be some sort of uh, you know, um, stigma around diabetes and why people weren't reporting this, but then we realized um, some of the interviews were trans translated from local languages and we realized that when doctors ask people about diabetes, have you ever di had diabetes or, um, the answers were often interpreted as do you, have you ever been um, diagnosed with a high sugar level? And so um, through the mistranslations within the survey as well as doctors, people would just say yes or no regarding their knowledge of sugar, not diabetes. So we think this might have messed with the results and why, yeah, hypertension was the only one where they actually took a measure of uh, blood pressure and then that's why the findings were so good because it was actually measured data. Um, yes, so I hope I've answered your question. I just want to respond to your question about how to take this information to practitioners and policy makers. I think this type of research highlights uh, the role of data within the urban space um, and therefore this has implications for both. Uh, if you bring this, this has essentially highlighted an urban health issue. Now, if you take this to public health practitioners, these are people on the ground who are able to treat it through a biomedical model, looking at um, actually treating the people individually. So the data particularly showed that hypertension usually would stereotypically be associated with older age groups, and it showed a strong correlation with age. But what the data was highlighting in our study was that it was very much occurring in younger populations between the age of 25 and 35 even, which is really interesting and it's an emerging trend in Africa. And this is something that practitioners need to know about because they can't just assume that just because a person is young that they're not gonna have something like hypertension. So that's one aspect. And then if you take this to the policy makers, there needs to be an intersectoral approach to addressing this type of urban health issue. Um, for example, if hypertension has been associated with something like obesity, which was the funding in our study, um, an intersectoral approach to addressing these type of NCDs would be looking at uh, possibly increasing tax on sugar and salt, so you use that sort of navigation to address um, these type of issues, or improving foods and schools if this is an issue that's occurring in the younger age groups, or promoting green spaces. So this is these are ways in which this type of information can actually help urban transformation through through that way. Yes. Uh, questions, uh, anyone? Second round? There was one in the back over here, Anya. Oh, sorry. Is there some? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, National Geographic, before it was forced into showing only how lions can kill and how snakes can eat and all the rest of it and turned so violent, did uh, quite a deep rated program on Pearl River. And uh, it uh, also, to some extent, talked about what you have said. But I was just curious to know whether yours was more, um, I mean, where, where you were being, uh, where you were heading, because there was just a sort of an aerial survey on how the city had changed in its landscape kind of thing. Are you going a bit beyond that uh, in your uh, analysis? Uh, 
I have uh, two questions for Stephen, and uh, absolutely a fascinating uh, project, and thank you for sharing that information. First question would be, um, given your dissatisfaction with the binary between rural and urban, um, how does that inform your thinking about the concept of region um, as an abstraction or as an uh, actual fixed geographic reality? Um, and then secondly, um, I guess is, is how should we understand um, your optimistic or um, enthusiastic embrace for open source data? Um, and to what extent has the train left the station? Um, and you, you call smart cities basically a branding enterprise. Um, of course, that branding enterprise is really uh, all about the reproduction of capital. And that question about closed source, open source, is precisely about the reproduction of capital. So I admire your project greatly, but you're up against Google. You're up against Amazon. And they got the data. You don't. You have a few satellite connections. They got the data. They own it. All right? And they will own us. So I, I think you're, you know, inspirational, but let's be realistic here about what's going on. Anyone else? We can take one more. If so my question is to Stephen again. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I, I just see the point about rural, urban, as a constructed category. So some, pe some people would say it's an ideological construct and that. So um, it's just a clarificatory question. So when you just say that if we just take demography as a, uh, uh, as a criteria of defining urban, and if we just situate that, uh, demog uh, that definition in the monsoon region or let's just say the, uh, uh, Dhaka or somewhere, and if, if we universalize that uh, definition of urban based on that density, and then a uh, whole of uh, uh, US and the, uh, 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 Europe will become rural. So then we are talking about uh, planetary ruralization. So both planetary urbanization and planetary ruralization in the end as a constructed uh, category. So I'm not sure if that was what you were suggesting in, in certain ways. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, just one quick thing again, I'm going to push back about from the anthropologists, and you just said that uh, <laughs> the anthropologists are also in the light of satellite, this thing. But I think the, 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 the fundament, not fundamental different, I don't want to be essentialist here, but in the sense that, uh, I mean, the difference between material uh, manifestations of culture, social and everything, and the interpretative one is the key difference. So when I think the anthropologists make a claim, and I think the physical, I think part, I think it, it comes into that as well. I think it, it, the access to that is so difficult. And I think the messiness, uh, no matter how many, what resolution of satellite which we, we can just garner, okay, that, that, that thing uh, is not there. And some people would say that even Google and Amazon, that, can, that does not have that kind of interpretative da data as well. So how do you uh, respond to, uh, I mean, any, any reaction to that? So, yeah, thanks for the question on um, Nachio's perspective on the Pearl River Delta. I think it was very useful. I've seen it myself uh, as well. Uh, but I think uh, their focus is on looking at the Lingnan geographic region, because uh, I saw the source that you're talking about. Uh, what I am trying to understand, even from um, looking at a historical perspective and looking at its present day frictions with the industrialization and urbanization, is to look at how you can incorporate the current conditions of old infrastructure and the environmental conditions and how that responds to what is being developed. So I'm always looking at this, uh, sorry, what's that? That's right. But looking at it in uh, overlay with the current conditions and what's being changed, what's being transformed. So it's almost like, uh, you know, the way land use or zoning practices are in this part of uh, China, uh, it's to place the notion of what is radical change almost in this overlay of um, being a little bit sensitive to the ecology of the region because uh, zoning kind of outlines the area and looks at this is what we're going to develop, but the ecology is spread across the region. 
And so it's important to understand the prevalent ecologies in the region, even though you're working at a very small site-specific and urban local scale. Um, great. Well, thanks for a set of really challenging questions. <laughs> um, but actually, I, I really enjoyed the, the way you, you shaped them. I think, in a way, the, the question of the region is a little bit linked um, to the, your, your question. Uh, um, I mean, we're, we're in a discursive space, so everything we talk about, of course, is, is construct. So I'm not to say we're stepping outside of that world into some other essentialist kind of space. It's just to try, I mean, this is, this is well-rehearsed sort of technique, so we need to be aware of the kind of categories which are in, 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 uh, in motion and structuring the conversations that we have. Um, I, I happen to feel that the term region uh, is, is better than, than the urban rural because it has a kind of ambiguity, but it brings its own, its own baggage as well, um, as does a whole range of other terms like hinterland, um, think we're a bit more urban, there's a megalopolis, cosm cosmopolis, ecumenopolis. Uh, you can, I mean, we all have our own favorite sort of, like the, so there are many, many different intellectual traditions. Um, I think that the urban and the rural gets, is, is too fixed and too strong. And I, I think the region, this is why the city region is very interesting. It's kind of hyphenized, so it's not turned into one or the other. So keeping that ambiguity, for me, is the best case current situation. Uh, I think it relates to your question because I, I'm not, for instance, what I couldn't show you is that all of those maps are dynamic. So live, we could say, well, what does a population density of 1,000 people per square kilometer look like? And of course, most of those boundaries shrink. Or if it's 200, they, they tend to expand and break up. I'm more interested in the dynamic quality of those measures. This is why uh, I'm not a data scientist, by the way. I'm sort of enjoying using data in a sort of non-expert way. But if you can make the data uh, uh, dynamic, then those edges become much, much more kind of fluid, and then they become context-specific. So in, a, in an environment like this, where the edge of the city is in fact the thing that we want to kind of study, um, I happen to show demographic, uh, but, but I'm painfully sensitive to the fact that the city is not only defined by demographics, right? I mean, there are hundreds. And there is no single definition of the city. Um, English cities used to be called the presence of a cathedral. You can have 50 people surrounded by a certain kind of status of church, and it would be called a city. Uh, the plus minus differential in Chinese uh, census taking could change that 50% figure to 27% back in 2007. So the degrees of different, uh, difference are so vast that we might as well try and get the best possible data and start to think about the data as a kind of medium into which to think the next set of vocabularies. So I know it somewhat circu circumvents the question about the region or not, but I tend to feel that it's the responsibility of us in this moment to try and start to come to terms with what are the new kind of terminologies. So the edge of the kind of Bangalore, you know, 2031, I mean, it's a, just a horrific, horrific diagram of a very historic way of saying this is the edge of a city making a master plan. Um, the fame, every data demographer knows that every edge is underbounded or overbounded. It's never, it never matches what it's trying to say. What, it never matches the demographic reality. So given that we have satellites circulating the, uh, the Earth, given that every one of us is a quote-unquote data point, we might as well try and get involved in the kind of the dynamic data that is around us all the time. Um, and if I come across as optimistic, um, I, I'm not at all. I want to downplay that, so I want to come to your your point about optimism, um, in our lab we had a, had a choice, a clear choice, whether to make the software a spin-off company or to make it open source. And if it's a spin-off company, you have to dig quite carefully into well, what, you have to make a business plan for it. And I couldn't find, and I didn't have the energy, I'm not interested in business, uh, I'm not interested in being a businessman. Uh, it struck us very quickly that in fact putting it open source is, is by far the most effective way to, to deploy something like this. Um, I fully expect this kind of technique to be, uh, to be adopted by Google any day now. Not, not our particular software, but of course they're looking around all the world all the time for open source platforms like this. Uh, we're in dialogue with Esri, for example, um, and Esri have seen this, and they were very polite, but we're, we're powerless for them to simply say, thanks very much, this is a really nice idea we'd like to adopt it and commercialize it. 
it's not something that we can do. However, to come to, come to your, your point, uh, one aspect of your point is open source still has the capacity in very large populated regions to have many, many more contributors to, contributors to that data. Um, it's the same model as Google in a way, except it doesn't have this kind of uh, commercial sort of payback. Um, but nonetheless, I think planning systems where they are, are decentralized have to, ha have to follow some kind of open source system. I just happen to believe that. Because I don't think centralized technology and centralized data systems can deliver the full complexity of all the urban challenges that we have. That's not to say that that's unnecessary. That's very important. So the, 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 the digitization of e-governance and so on is a very significant development. But I don't think it should go without a very robust open source grass, grassroots data culture as well. Um, excuse me if I just... Uh, yeah, the final, the final point about anthropology, um, I didn't mean to sound, that, sound flippant. Um, I think I, 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 I come across perhaps as enthusiastic about, about uh, data and satellites and so on, but um, I profoundly believe in incommensurability uh, of experience. And we've had a lot of people with our data, with a platform to try and say, well, when I zoom in onto a particular village or town, could you then show me all the photographs that I took from the field and my field notes and all the interviews that I did, with, and I could geolocate them and you could put them in dialogue with the data. And we did some experiments around that, but we decided that's just not the way it should happen. So we've, in a way, uh, adopted this kind of incommensurable position. Um, so when I say uh, the anthropologist is in the gaze of the satellite, I think that's just an empirical fact. Uh, I do happen to think there are most, lo lots of advantages of that. And you saw, I think, all of the panelists were using data that was satellite uh, delivered in some form or other. Um, but I would still hold on to this kind of incommensurability kind of point for the reasons you say. Um, um, and just to come back to your very, the, the other point, I, I think that this binary position, there aren't too many people who are really working on that. And I come back to the, the planetary urbanization story, why that's so significant is because it is a philosophical project as well as a kind... Actually, it's more philosophical than it is empirical. But, of course, there are many students attached to that program who are doing these amazing empirical sorts of studies. So why I find it especially interesting is because of this... its, it's interest in undoing this, this epistemological sort of legacy that we have. Um, of course, we still have to use it and we still have to deploy it. So how we do that, I think, is, 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 is shifts the game a little bit. Thanks.